injury. Yeah. Why are you hiding now? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's a big feast day today. It's the feast of the Immaculate Conception. So, uh, just a quick reminder. Uh, it's a holiday of obligation. So, please um, find mass. some time to go to Mass. Okay? Um, I'm sure there are plenty of Masses scheduled all over the world today. So, and that is to accommodate everybody's schedule to be able to uh, go and celebrate this particular feast day which is a very important feast day in the church. And that's what we're going to talk about today for us to understand a little bit about the, uh, the nature of the Immaculate Conception and what, what it is all about. Okay? So the Immaculate Conception. Immaculate means... Anybody? Holy, holy, holy. Well, yeah, holy, but... But... Eh? Free from sin. Immaculate means pure. Okay? It means pure. So conception means? Conceiving means a child in the womb. Okay. So the time, at that point in time where a child is formed in the womb of a mother. Okay. So the doctrine, the doctrine and the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady is... Uh, an assertion, an assertion of the belief that Our Lady, when she was conceived in the womb of Saint Anne, her mother Saint Anne, okay, when she was conceived in the womb of Saint Anne, she was immediately, immediately free from sin. Sin did not touch her soul. Okay. Sin was absent from the moment of her conception. What is the difference between that and us? And by the way, what sin are we talking about? Original, Original sin. sin. Okay? Now, what's the difference between that and us? When we are conceived, all of us, because Our Lady is the only exception, okay? when we were all conceived, we were conceived with a stain of original sin. Okay, yes, Shana. Um, so she still baptized? Uh, no, she didn't have to be at that point. So was she? No. Yeah, baptism came afterwards, right? Baptism came after, oh. after uh, the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. That was the only time that the sacraments got institutionalized. See, by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So before that, there was no such baptism that would free people from original sin. That is why, that is why the uh, crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ was, was uh, in this sense necessary. Because that was the vehicle, the avenue to free us from sin. Yes, Mia. Then, well, how did John the Baptist baptize you? Oh, okay. That's a different kind of baptism. It was just a baptism of repentance. It was called baptism of repentance mm -hmm. to help people... To help people uh, repent from their sins so that they can be better prepared to accept Jesus who was coming into the world. See, very good question, Mia. But baptism is not like that. Baptism is a little different. Okay? Baptism that we receive uh, uh, removes uh, original sin from our soul. Okay? But, but first we were born with it and then baptism removes it. In the case of Our Lady... She was not even conceived with it. See? So Our Lady was not even conceived with original sin. When she was conceived in the womb of Saint Anne, she was already free from that. Not, not a stain of, of sin ever touched her soul. Okay? And that is something that the church has believed all throughout the centuries. It is something that the church has believed, but uh, there, were, there were several heresies that, uh, that came up all throughout time and uh, god bless you the, and so the pope um the pope in uh, pope pius the ninth in 1854 decides to uh, make a formal pronouncement of that doctrine so that from then on it became a dogma 
of the Catholic faith. Okay? A dogma, a dogma, what is a dogma? Huh? Huh? A belief, an article of faith that we, that we Catholics are compelled to believe. Because if we do not believe them, if we doubt them, if we do not believe them, okay, those dogmas, we are at risk of sin. Okay? So dogmas are, uh, are uh, um, elements of doctrine, elements of faith, matters of faith that we are compelled to believe in. Okay? And there is no question about it. There's no question about its authority, about its, about, uh, its uh, authenticity. Okay? Uh, and that is why it's proclaimed uh, ex cathedra. Okay? Ex cathedra. From the cathedra, from the chair of Peter. Okay? The magisterial authority of the church. Okay? The magisterial authority of the Pope and the church and the bishops united with the Pope declare certain matters of faith as dogmas in such a very formal way like that so that there'll be no mistake about the truth and the authority behind such a dogma okay so we're very lucky in our church in the catholic church that we have such authority that uh, that uh, our faith and our beliefs are not matters of opinion right and this is where I'm sorry to say our uh, our departed I mean our departed our our um, um, uh, uh, lost brothers and sisters in the Protestant faiths or in the other faiths uh, are missing. Okay? They are missing because uh, in those other uh, faiths it's all a question of their opinion. However, they interpret the Bible. That's it for them. Okay? But in our case, we have thankfully God has. That God has uh, fulfilled His promise that He's going to be sending the Holy Spirit to us, and the Holy Spirit will guide the church. And this is, in one sense, how the Holy Spirit guides the church all throughout the centuries. Okay? So, so that in in uh, 1854, December 8, Pope Pius the Ninth pronounced that dogma through the Constitution in a fabulous Deus, in a fabulous Deus. That's the Constitution that proclaimed. Mary's Immaculate Conception. That Mary, and that to define it again, that Mary was conceived without sin. Okay? Let us not confuse this because some people think that Ma uh, Immaculate Conception means Mary conceiving Jesus without sin. No, it's not that, right? It is Mary being conceived without sin in the womb of St. Anne. <clears throat> okay? So December 8th, uh, is the date fixed by the church to commemorate that uh, occasion when our lady was conceived. Okay, so um, so she was preserved. She was exempt from original sin. The same sin that all of us are born with, but in the case of our lady, she was free from that sin. Now, where, where do we get that? Where do we get that idea? Where does the church base its belief that our lady was conceived without sin? There are two, there are two uh, sources of that in Scripture. One is from the moment of the commission of original sin by Adam and Eve in Genesis. See? When Adam and Eve committed original sin, the first sin, right? God already at that point. You see, and this is what I've been saying in, in our, in, during the baptism classes that I used to give, right? Uh, uh, Adam and Eve committed the original sin. And they had no way of uh, of really of really uh, repairing their sin. Okay? Uh, it was such a big sin, and and the one offended was God Himself. So there was no way for these mere creatures to uh, to to make up for their own offenses, to make up for their own sin. So God Himself had to come up with a way out. God Himself had to come up with a way to redeem His own creatures from that grave sin of original sin that they committed, the sin of pride and disobedience, which are the main elements of, of original sin. Right? So what was the way out that God thought of? God, uh, from the very beginning, designed a way out by giving His own Son. 
to be the one to redeem mankind from sin. But that redemption, that giving of his own son who will take on human flesh, could only happen and would only happen through the intervention of a woman. Right? Because God wanted that, that uh, his own son be born in a, uh, in a natural way, the way that every other human being would be born on earth. Okay? And so he had to uh, solicit, so to speak, uh, the cooperation of another creature, of a woman that he himself was going to create and prepare in order to receive for the world this great gift of uh, Jesus Christ. Okay? And so from the very beginning, God already uh, uh, prophesied in Genesis that there will be a woman. Okay? There will be a woman. I will put enmity between you and a woman. He was talking to the devil here. He was talking to Satan here. I will put enmity between you and a woman. Between your seed and her seed. See? Her seed meaning the fruit of her womb. See? Her own son. See? And he is going to crush the heel of hell's serpent. See? The, the head. Her, yeah, sorry. Uh, her heel, his heel is going to crush the head of hell's serpent. I'm distracted by Chabelle's crying right here. Okay, so right from Genesis, right from Genesis, God already foretold the way out, the solution that he had uh, 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 um, made or provided for mankind to be redeemed from sin. So that is where we get that idea of the Immaculate Conception, the idea of the virgin being, being born. Okay? And, then, and then besides that, the other, the other uh, source of this belief is on the uh, occasion of the Annunciation. When the angel Gabriel, what's the Annunciation again? When the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she was... Okay. When the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she was to be the mother of God. And what did the angel Gabriel tell her? What were the words of the angel Gabriel? Hail! Hail Mary, full of grace. You see? So that very short statement right there was very loaded. It was a very loaded statement. Full of grace. Okay? Somebody who has sin and stained by sin cannot be full of grace. Right? Because that means that there's some deficiency there. There's some defect. Okay? Uh, that, that our Lord's redemptive uh, action has to fill up in order for a person to be full of grace. Okay? Uh, in this case, uh, the angel Gabriel already called Our Lady that. He called Our Lady full of grace. Okay? And that is one very powerful short statement where uh, the, the, the church gets the, uh, that confirmation of that belief. That Our Lady was conceived without sin. Okay? In order for her to be full of grace. And you know what? This belief of the church was confirmed by Our Lady herself. Our Lady herself confirmed this faith of the church. Four years after the declaration um, uh, of the Pope, Pius IX, of this particular dogma. So when was the confirmation? What, what, what year was that declaration? 1854. Okay. Four years later. Which means in what year? 1854. Four years later Jacob. 1858. During the apparition of Our Lady. To Saint Bernadette Subaru. Okay, Bernadette Subaru, where uh, Bernadette was asking her, uh, "Who are you? Who are you, lady, that I might uh, be able to? Because my bishop is asking you me to to ask you who you are. They, what am I going to tell him? Because they don't want to believe me that there's a lady appearing to me. So what? And that there's a lady asking for a church and all that. So what am I going to tell my bishop? See? Now here, 
Bernadette Subaru is not a very well educated uh, girl at well, at her age. She was not uh, yet very well catechized, and there was no way for her to understand, um, you know, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception at that time, which was also very fresh. Right? It was only four years uh, since the Declaration, but Our Lady told her, "I am." The Immaculate Conception. Okay? That's what Our Lady told her. I am the Immaculate Conception. And so that's what you tell the bishop. And so Bernadette Subiru had to memorize that many times. She repeated it to herself. Immaculate Conception, Immaculate Conception, Immaculate Conception. As she was going to the bishop, she kept repeating the Immaculate Conception because it was something she never heard of before. And that is how the bishop was able to tell that this apparition must be authentic because there was just no way by which Bernadette Subaru could have known about the Immaculate Conception. Yeah, see? So that was the, the biggest proof. So when the bishop heard that from Bernadette Subaru, Immaculate Conception, boy, he said, this must be authentic. This must be true. And so the rest is history. And then, but then it didn't even stop there. It did not stop there. Uh, um, uh, there was another saint, Saint Catherine Labor. Okay, Saint Catherine Labor, who was given the the medal of the miracle, the miraculous medal. Mm -hmm. So Our Lady gave the miraculous medal to Saint Catherine, and. And she again confirmed to St. Catherine that I am the Immaculate Conception and that I want you to propagate this medal, the devotion to the medal. Okay? I want you to propagate the devotion to the medal of uh, the Miraculous Medal. So, and at that time, Our Lady even taught St. Catherine this very famous uh, prayer, which we, we actually repeat many times now. It says, O Mary, conceived without sin, eh? pray for us who have recourse to thee. And it's a very beautiful short prayer that we can, we can pray very often. Mary, O Mary, conceived without sin. See, conceived without sin, Immaculate Conception. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Eh? Today... Today, we can learn to pray that prayer more often. I know that we, it's not a familiar prayer for you yet. I have been praying that quite often, but uh, maybe today is a good day for all of you to learn that and make that a, uh, a short aspiration beginning today and many times, uh, during today and many times every day, right? We can pray that short aspiration to Our Lady to honor her Today on her feast day. Okay? And to honor her every day. See? Oh Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to thee. Okay. That's it for us folks. Have a good and blessed day today. The Immaculate Conception. Remember to go to Mass. It's a holiday of obligation. So uh, and, and celebrate. Celebrate. It's a day of celebration. So tonight we are also going to have some celebration uh, for for supper, for dinner, and uh, have a cake or something like that and celebrate with Our Lady on this very, 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 very big feast day and uh, make her very much part of your life. Okay, And if you want, hey, get a miraculous medal. It's available anywhere. And uh, have a devotion. Have a devotion to Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal, the Immaculate Conception. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Have a good day.